E7 is a notable game in the series for quite a few reasons. It was the first game to use the party system, it is the first East game set on the continent of Africa instead of Europa since East 5, making it the very first East game set in Africa that was actually localized, and until East 9 came around, it was the last journey of adults on the East timeline. Despite the changes to what was the standard for East previously, East 7 is a good game and a good East game specifically. The story takes some calculated risks with the East formula to great success, and the gameplay, while rough at times, has those moments of clarity that show what the party system would become later down the line. It is not the prettiest looking game in the series, although it sounds very nice, but that doesn't weigh it down too much when taken as a whole. I had a surprisingly good time playing East 7, pushing it up there on my favorite East games list, and while it has its issues, the sum of the game is very positive. E7 is an action role-playing game developed by Nihon Falcom and localized and published in the West by Xseed Games. The game was initially released for the PSP in Japan in 2009 with a Western release in 2010. Fun fact, E7 remains the East game with the fastest localization in series history. The game was given a PC port for China in 2012 and one for the West in 2017. The events of East 7 take place not long after the events of East 6 and before the events of East 9, but you do not need to have played either game to understand this one, although there are the usual references to former games that you'll catch on to if you've played the rest of the series minus the two that came after 7. Upon release, the game was met with positive reviews focusing on gameplay and music with most critiques pointing to the game's graphics. Now to answer the question you've all been waiting for. What trouble has Adol Kristen landed himself in now? Red-haired adventurer Adol Kristen, along with his playable for the first time in series history wall crusher friend Dogi, arrives safely via boat in the port capital of the Kingdom of Altago, so you already know this story is going to subvert your expectations from the get-go. With the peace treaty just signed between Altago and the Rom Empire, it is Adol's first chance to visit, and upon arriving, he immediately gets into trouble saving a girl from the unwanted attentions of one of the army's commanders. Despite this somewhat rocky start, Adol soon gets the opportunity to travel around Altago, learning about the land and interacting with the people at the behest of the king. The king is troubled by the growing natural phenomenon in the kingdom with strong beasts appearing and a new disease called Iskin Fever spreading. On Adol's journey, he will attempt to uncover the mysteries of these phenomena, learning much about the land and history of the people living here along the way. He must be wary though, because he has more than monsters to worry about as powerful forces move to stop him in his efforts. The story's standout feature for me was the desire to challenge some usual narratives seen in the East series and other video game series in general. Without getting into spoilers, the story kept me guessing for much of the game, and while I could see some things coming, East 7 tended to put a twist on them sending ripples of ramifications out among the cast. These ripples had a profound effect because I felt the Kingdom of Altago was a well-realized nation with problems and strength that were noticeably affected by the events of the game. Talking with the NPCs helped give insight throughout the game even if they weren't all that deep of characters. For the playable characters though, I felt that they were alright with one particular standout character who has shot up my favorite East character list. Disclaimer, list may not be fully formed yet, so hard to make grand statements as to their ranking. The writing for the game was entertaining and enlightening when it came to deepening the world and lore, but I do wish the game had taken the time to let us find out more about some of the cast and established a stronger dynamic between all the characters. As always, strong characters lend themselves to stronger emotional attachment from the players, and I think Seven was a bit uneven in their efforts to form that connection. As for gameplay, East 7 introduced the party system to the East games, and any time a new system of gameplay is brought in for the series, there are bound to be growing pains. While the system may not be the smoothest, it is still fun and has a lot of great ideas. In East 7, your active party consists of up to three members doing battle at one time. Each of your party members has a damage type they can inflict. The damage types are Slash, Strike, and Pierce, and certain enemies are weak to certain damage types, so in order to take advantage of those weaknesses, you should be switching whichever character you, the player, are using. It's thankfully not required to be constantly switching since a good number of enemies are just neutral to all damage types, but it's best to be ready with a well-balanced party at all times. 
The game will let you know how your attacks are performing with different color numbers depending on if your attacks are effective, neutral, or ineffective. While I do wish they showed what damage types each enemy is weak to in a way similar to what you see in later East Party games, it's not too hard to figure out after you've attacked one who you should be using and then you can make the switch. In addition to damage type, your characters also have special abilities. You select four abilities to have on each character and they level up with continued use. These abilities require SP to use, which you gain from attacking enemies, and even more so if you let yourself charge before attacking. These abilities in turn can charge up your extra bar, which when full can be consumed to release an ultimate attack that does massive amounts of damage. The other way to speed up the process of getting your extra bar up is by successfully pulling off a flash guard. If you time a guard for a precise moment when your enemy is about to attack, you get temporary immunity and 100% critical damage chance on all your attacks. The flash guard can be risky, however, because if you mistime it, then the enemy will do critical damage to you. As you can tell, there are a lot of different moving pieces to figure out in battle, especially for those who haven't played an East Party System game before. But give it time, and you'll be slashing, striking, and piercing enemies left and right. The enemy variety and tactics for defeating them isn't a standout aspect of the game. The main thing you need to pay attention to is how each enemy gears up to attack so you can either time your flash guard or a dodge if you don't want to risk mistiming. Unlike future party system games, flash dodge slash move is not in E7. I found that most enemies could be taken out easily, but that's the standard enemies. You see, E7 has some new monsters that mainly come out as boss battles called Titanos. True to their name, they tend to be big and hit hard so you best be careful when taking one on or else you'll fall quickly. The bosses are the most challenging fights, and it is in a mixture of good and bad ways. The bosses have a lot of unique attacks and abilities that test your personal skill and the skills of your characters, but the main reason they're difficult is because they're damage sponges. That does make the bosses monotonous at times because you've already figured out how to defeat them and now you have to spend minutes chipping down their health. For all the complaints regarding combat, I think E7 captured the energy that I enjoy from East Combat. During battle, it is active and hectic, and thus satisfying once you've vanquished your enemy. Not everything in the game, though, is about defeating enemies. Along your journey, you will encounter many spots where you can pick up ingredients that will be used to synthesize items or can be given to various people to fulfill the good amount of side quests in the game. While, in my opinion, too many of the side quests could be described as fetch quests, the rewards for completing them and their lack of major time consumption made them worthwhile to finish. Conveniently, some of the longer quests allow you to give them items you discover in each new area over time, so the structure of the quests tend towards making life easier for you and your efforts to get money. You'll especially need that money to keep upgrading the weapons and armor for the party as a whole. Grinding is always possible, but completing the side quests and taking on enemies I found without going out of my way was enough to keep my party well stocked for pretty much the entire game. If you do want the ultimate weapons or armor though, you'll need to do some item grinding at the very least, but since they are the ultimate items, I think it is appropriate for them to require greater effort to obtain. All of the journeying around would be a major hassle if you couldn't fast travel, but thankfully, you can! As usual for the series, there are pillars around the map you can fast travel to once you've received the item that permits fast travel, which thankfully happens pretty early on in 7. The monuments are also full heals, but they are not save points unlike some of the previous games, because you can actually save in whatever place you want at pretty much any time. Save flexibility is always fun to have in-game, and not just because it makes it much easier for me to get footage for these videos. Now we come to the presentation of the game, and I'll start with the major positive for the game, which is the soundtrack. E7's soundtrack is excellent, there's no two ways about it. The music as a whole is a hit in each new area, new battle, new boss, and even new rendition of a previously established tune in-game. If you enjoy the music in Falcom games, I guarantee you'll enjoy E7 soundtrack. Heck, if you enjoy video game music at all, you'll like E7's music. On the visual side of things, while the opening art and character portraits look nice, the in-game models and environments don't match that quality. Poor Doki, what did they 
do to you, my man? This style is likely due to the limitations of the PSP as a console, and I will say, they aren't bad, it just doesn't reach the same charm as the Nepishtim system games or the polish of Silsetta or 8. It makes sense to me that E7 was the last East game made for the PSP. As for voice acting, the only voiced lines are in battle cries when attacking, not even the skills, just standard attacking. So there's nothing much to comment on regarding that. I will say that the PC port which I played was smooth as butter. No issues at any point, and I imagine the game looks much better than it would on the PSP. E7 is clearly a game with some ambitious ideas for the series. Some of them worked in 7, some got refined into excellent features in later games, and some simply didn't work then or now. Falcom took a big swing with the game though, and I think they got a good game out of it. The world is fun, the combat smooth, and music superb. While the story has its ups and downs, the ups rise up to standout points that will stick with you after completing the game, and I think some of the characters were really well written. If you enjoyed the East series, 7 is a must play. If you're new to the series, there are other games I would encourage you to play first, but I do recommend coming back to this one in the future to get in on the fun. With that, it is time for my long-awaited arrival at East 8. I hope you're ready for that video when it comes, because I've been looking forward to East 8 for a while now. As for 7, I hope this video was enjoyable and informative, and I would appreciate it greatly if you were to give it a like as I try to use this video to return balance to a world thrown into chaos by the YouTube algorithm. Comment below your thoughts on East, East 7, or anything else that comes to mind, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already to keep following the channel. Have a great day, and happy gaming.